do. Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Paul Seip and I'm BMO's head of business banking for Western Canada. As we gather here today, we acknowledge the land we live on has for many millennia been the traditional territory of indigenous nations. We acknowledge the long history of indigenous peoples across Turtle Island with great respect to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities across Canada. I'm joining you today from Vancouver on the unceded lands of the traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam First Nations. We honor and recognize the First Peoples and the ongoing contribution to the vibrancy of our communities today. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and work together on this land. We're excited to have you join us today as Doug Porter, BMO's chief economist, dives into key market insights arising out of these past 18 months, a historically challenging time around the world. After spending many months in survival mode, dealing with the complexities and uncertainties of the pandemic, restrictions have slowed and we're very optimistic about the future. While I'll leave the forecasting to Doug, it's becoming more clear that we can expect a recovery that's strong building off of pent up demand, which will carry us through in 2022. And with vaccines well underway, COVID spread appears to be slowing, limiting disruptions so businesses have a smoother path ahead in their recovery. We're also seeing new businesses opening more now than pre-pandemic trends. And there's a major shift to digital. The pandemic led many business owners to build online storefronts and robust e-commerce plans, which only helped them stay ahead. This is all very encouraging for us and the business community at large. At BMO, we look and believe it's time to look ahead toward the opportunities as our economy reopens and regains its strength and momentum. Whether you're a local restaurant or an online business, you are the engine of our local communities and our country's economy. You're the reason it thrives. That's why it's incredibly important for us at BMO to see you come out of this stronger than ever with the important information and support that you need so you can focus on what's important in growing your business. Throughout the pandemic and beyond, our team is here to work closely with each of you. We're here to listen, to offer expert advice tailored to your business's unique needs and ensure that you're positioned for a healthy recovery so that you can make real financial progress. And that is what today is all about. So with that, let's get started. Doug will give us a full view on what's happening in our Western Canadian markets and the economy at large and how it's impacting our economy and perhaps your business. After Doug's update, we'll open the floor for questions as well as address the themes and questions that were submitted in advance. Please feel free to raise a question throughout via the ask the question box on the bottom of your screen. And we'll be sure to keep an eye out for these and position with Doug shortly. Finally, as we close out Small Business Month, a time to celebrate your success and contributions to your communities. I wanna thank you for trusting us with your business. With that, I'll turn it over to Doug. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to uh, to everyone on on the call, depending on where you are at this uh, this point. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you today, even if it's uh, only virtually. Uh, I do look forward to the day, hopefully in the not too distant future, when we can all meet uh, meet again in person to to go over the economic outlook and uh, and and the financial market backdrop. And I have to say, just uh, segueing from uh, from Paul's remarks, um, I've I've been at this for for many decades. And I have to say, in uh, many respects, this is about as complicated an economic backdrop I've uh, I've ever witnessed in in my career. Ar arguably, even more complicated than during the depths of the downturn in in 2020, um, because really we we've gone from, you know, being the primary concern about the uh, the pandemic to now probably the biggest challenge that we're facing is uh, with some of the supply issues. And I I would just before I get into to my chart, just as a as a very overall big picture comment, you know, we've probably all heard all kinds of uh, chatter about supply chains in, in recent months. I would just reinforce the message that supply is actually now at an all time high. Really, the issue here is it is just being overtaken by a tidal wave of spending demand uh, 
um, are everywhere around the world. And supply is, is trying its very best to keep up, but it just cannot keep pace. And with that, I'd actually like to just turn to my uh, to my first slide, just past the uh, the title page. I'll I'll let you enjoy this little uh, cartoon uh, for a moment because I think it actually captures what many businesses and we're all dealing with to some extent in a, in a nice, neat, somewhat humorous nutshell. I think in many ways uh, Santa's punchline is is especially good. Um, you know where he talks about we're actually out of coal as well. Who knew? In this uh, this world where you know most of us are trying to move away from coal, that there's even been a shortage of of even that, um, and there there is a shortage, by the way, in uh, in China. But I think it really just plays in this car, comic strip plays to just how broad based the issues we are facing in in the economy right uh, right now. And I do I'll get into it more in a minute, but I think it really is one of the dominant economic stories out there. Now, if we could turn to the uh, the first chart, the uh, the next slide, of course, the other issue, which has not gone away, and I'm, I'm sure almost everyone here wishes it would go away, uh, but the reality is it is still looming over the economic outlook, and that is uh, is COVID. The, the numbers on the left uh, show a rolling seven-day average of new cases in the US, in Europe, and Canada, and it is on a per capita basis, so it is comparable. And there's some good news there. Um, definitely after a fourth wave in Canada and the U.S., we've seen the numbers come down and come down pretty aggressively in, uh, in recent weeks. Of course, it matters where in each country you're at. But from, uh, from a bigger picture view, I think there's no doubt that the fourth wave is, uh, is well past its crest. And uh, we, we've gotten those numbers down fairly nicely in, in much of the country and much of the continent. The one thing I'm keeping my eye on is what's going on in Europe. We've actually seen the numbers tick back up again. It's mostly localized in places like the U.K. and a few other economies. And what we're seeing there is the so-called Delta Plus variant apparently is spreading, and that's certainly something worth watching. When we look ahead, there's two things that give me a bit of comfort. First of all, as you can see from the right-hand chart, the vaccination rates are very, very high in almost all the Western world. The U.S. is a little bit of a laggard, but even there, uh, the vaccination rate is relatively high. Uh, the other thing that gives me comfort is I do believe the economy is learning to deal and individuals are learning to deal better with each wave. Certainly, that's been the case here in Canada. So while there may be a fifth wave, there may be a sixth wave, um, when we consider what that means for the economy, we don't believe it will make a lasting mark on the outlook in, in the year ahead. It may restrain uh, the pace of growth, but I actually believe that a bigger restraint or limiter on growth will in fact be the, the many supply issues that we face. And, and increasingly COVID will be less of an economic story and more exclusively just a health story. I shouldn't say just, it, it will be exclusive exclusively a health story. If we turn to the next chart, please. Uh, so what, do, what does this mean for global growth? So the, the title of the overall event today was, was Roaring Back. And, you know, even though we have had our growth forecast clipped a little bit, both globally and in North America, by, you know, the various waves, the, the Delta variant, by the supply chain issues, I think the bigger picture here is just how well the global economy did come back from the depths last year. You know, even though our growth forecast has been trimmed somewhat, we're still looking at almost 6% global growth this year and almost 5% growth next year. Just to put all these numbers into perspective, a normal year for the global economy is 3% growth or so. So we've had nothing like a normal year. Last year, of course, was one of the deepest downturns that we've seen in the post-war era. But the economy has come bouncing back in a very significant way. It's still got ground to make up before we're completely back to normal until we're back to the underlying growth trend. That may actually not be the case until 2024. You know, I, I personally believe that in North America, we'll be back to pretty close to normal by the end of late next year. Um, but not every area of the world is going to be back. Not every sector of the world will be back either. Um, you know, some, some areas, slower vaccination rollout, um, you know, or more relying on the tourism sector, for instance, that that recovery may be more of a 2023 story. And this, you know, we're not completely back to normal until 24. Um, but I, I, again, I think the the overriding story here is just how well the global economy actually did manage this extremely difficult episode. And while we didn't hit maximum growth rates that we were hoping at maybe back in the spring, it's still been a very forceful recovery. So that's a very big picture. Look, if we turn to the next chart, please on the North American situation, it's roughly comparable. Uh, again, some of the, you know, the most optimistic forecasts that certainly we had and others had earlier this year have been dimmed a little bit. At one point, we thought the U.S. economy might grow by 7% this year, and that's after inflation. That would be the strongest year in decades and decades. Well, 
you know, between Delta and supply chains, we've had to cut that back to about five and a half percent growth, but five and a half percent growth is still a very strong year. In North America, sort of a typical growth year, just to put all these numbers into perspective, a typical growth year is something closer to 2%. So we had, you know, the, the deepest drop of the post-war era in North, North America last year, we've had one of the strongest bounce backs that we've seen in decades in both Canada and the US. Now, Canada, it's been a little bit less of a bounce back this year. We're, we're looking at close to 5% growth. At one point, we thought we could get up to 6 But again, the third wave is really what uh, what knocked us uh, for a loop in uh, in this economy, the third wave and not uh, not Delta. Um, if, if you take a look at the, the line chart on the left, that shows you the level of activity. You can see in Canada, we dropped further during the downturn back in the spring of 2020, we've been a little bit slower to recover. And that largely just speaks to the fact that Canada had more intense shutdowns that lasted longer and cropped up again this year. You know, we actually saw growth stall out in the spring during the third wave while the US uh, forged ahead. So we've got a bit more catching up to do. And for that reason, we actually think Canada will grow faster than the US in 2022 and probably even a little bit faster in 2023 as we're still catching up. Uh, to where the U.S. is. Um, the other the other point I would make there is if, if you look carefully at that chart, the U.S. is actually now uh, their third quarter numbers just came in today. Their their level of vote put or spending is actually above where it was before the pandemic began. Uh, you know they're all the way back. They've fully recovered. We're not there yet. We get a monthly report on uh, our economic output tomorrow for the month of August and a preliminary number number for September. We think it's going to show that the economy is still operating about a percent below where it was before the pandemic began. So again, just speaking to the fact that we've got more catching up to do, and we think we will catch up uh, mostly in uh, in 2022. So if we turn to the next chart, let's take a look at what it means for the, uh, the regional outlook. Um, you know, much like the, the global economy, uh, every single region of the country was hit, hit and hit hard last year, and every single region has seen a nice bounce back this year. But there have been some pretty significant differences among provinces. And, you know, how deeply provinces got hit last year really came down to two th factors. You know, was the province an oil producer? And how hard was it hit by COVID? What was its experience with COVID? So the hardest hit provinces between those two factors were Alberta, Quebec, Newfoundland, and Saskatchewan. The le least hard hit were the Maritimes in BC. This year, it's not exactly a mirror image, but it's pretty close. So the economies that suffered the deepest downdraft, not surprisingly, have seen one of the biggest bounce backs this year, like Alberta and Quebec, whereas the Maritimes have seen a very small bounce back because they didn't get hit as hard last year. I think more importantly is what's going to happen in the next couple of years, because to many respects, the last couple of years have been a, have been a mirror image. When we look further out, we see the best growth dynamics in places like Ontario and BC. Longer term, we do see BC as having the best growth uh, prospects in the country. And if you were to add up three, these three years, 2021 and 22, you'd find that BC overall probably fared the best, partly because it, it had a relatively better pandemic than, uh, than other provinces, and partly because it had, we think, the best funder, fundamental underlying growth rates. The other province I would circle as potential for a very big upgrade from this forecast, there's no doubt about it, Alberta. Given oil prices, if they can stick around anything close to current levels, nat gas prices close to $5 or above, there, there is clear upside to our call on, on Alberta. You know, the sky, I wouldn't say the sky is the limit, but it, uh, it could certainly grow a lot faster than that if energy prices stay at these, uh, these relatively favorable levels. But again, I, th I think the big point here is just how well most economies have bounced back from a very difficult uh, performance next year and how we're still looking at relatively above average growth in much of the country, even out in 2022. Now, if we can turn to the next slide, please. One area where I've really been impressed with how quickly things have turned around has been the job market. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, it was reported that Canada now has as many people employed as we did before the pandemic began. Now, of course, the population has grown since February 2020. You know, a lot of kids have uh, graduated from school over, over that period of time. The labor force is bigger than it was before the pandemic began. So the unemployment rate isn't all the way back down. But I, that is a really important line, uh, milestone, that there are as many Canadians employed as there were back in February 2020. And I dare say, in the depths of the downturn, very, very few people would have believed it would be possible that within, you know, 18 months, we'd have employment back to pre-pandemic levels. That is a tremendous achievement. Uh, as I said, there's still some work to do before we get the jobless rate down to quote normal. We think that could take up to as much as a year. You know, the sectors that have been, that are still swimming upstream still face a lot of challenges, even getting people back on the job. Uh, the entertainment industry, the travel industry, the hotel and restaurant industry. Uh, 
you know, still still has a has a job to do for for sure. But we are relatively confident that the unemployment rate will be back to something close to normal. One thing I would point out on this chart is look at unemployment rates today in Canada, the U.S. versus pre-pandemic levels. It's almost identical in terms of the deterioration in the two countries. Both are up at one and a quarter percentage point from pre-pandemic levels. And that's despite the fact we've had a very, very different performance, um, a very different experience with the, with the virus than, uh, than the U.S. If I had to distill it down to a really simple sentence, I would say Americans were much more willing and able to get back out and spend earlier than their Canadian counterparts, especially on services. But Canadians were much more willing and able to get back to the, on the job than their American counterparts. So our employment numbers uh, recovered a lot more quickly than the U.S. did. One of the reasons why the U.S. unemployment rate has come down is a lot of Americans have given up. They've dropped out of the labor force. They've had a tremendous wave of retirements or people who just aren't willing to uh, to work. And so, you know, the unemployment rate is actually arguably hiding as much as it's telling us at this point. But, uh, you know, I, th I think, again, the main message here is just how quickly things reversed. Very different story from the last recession, especially in the U.S., where it took years and years and years to get the unemployment rate back down. This time it happened in, in less than two years. Uh, if we turn to the next chart, please. Now, uh, one really defining aspect of this cycle one very unusual cycle is how well household disposable incomes held up through what was a very challenging episode. Last year, Canadian household disposable income rose by more than 10%. That is the strongest annual gain in household incomes in 40 years in a recession. There's no mystery what's going on here. It was the massive government support that help support uh, especially low income households through this very challenging episode. And this was happening at a time when Canadians, you know, were, were basically constrained in what they could spend. We could buy goods, but we really couldn't buy a lot of services. Even today, it's tough to buy services, especially things like travel. So, you know, we had on the one side, incomes incredibly well supported while Canadians could only spend on certain things. So what happened? Savings exploded. And they still remain high, even to this day. If you look at that chart on the left-hand side, the savings rate in Canada now is still way, way above where it was before the pandemic began. And then, of course, there's all that savings that Canadians socked away in the last 18 months or so. We, we estimate it's about $270 billion of savings above and beyond what Canadians would have normally saved over that time period. That is to more than 10% of our economy. That represents a tremendous stock of potential spending firepower. Now, is it all going to get spent? I don't think so. I think some of this actually will turn into permanent savings, especially in the higher income groups, but a lot of it will get spent, a lot. And this is also the case in the U.S. Uh, their savings rate has actually come back down uh, to pre-pandemic levels, but that doesn't take account of all the money that was socked away in the last 18 months. In the U.S., there's more than $2 trillion sitting on household balance sheets. I believe that the majority of this will eventually get spent. Um, one of my favorite phrases is uh, revenge travel. I think we're going to see a lot of revenge travel in the next couple of years by Americans and Canadians, and they're not going to be that price sensitive. They're going to willing, be willing to pay up uh, to, to travel or to get out and engage in entertainment or dining out again in the next couple of years. So that brings me to the next topic. If we can turn to the next chart, please. This will actually continue to feed into inflation, the fact that consumers aren't as price sensitive and they are extremely flush at, at this point. That's one of the reasons why inflation has perked up so much. There's all kinds of different factors why inflation is, uh, has perked up. You know, I talked about the supply shortages and, and there it's mostly the chip shortage, which is actually leading, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to basically a mismatch between supply and demand and all kinds of goods, cars, electronics, televisions, appliances. Uh, you know, that, that's one factor. We've had a bounce back in gasoline and energy prices more generally. We've had a comeback in things like airfares and hotel charges. You know, simply put, it's just we've got this wave, this tidal wave of spending and demand at a time when supply is limited and constrained. It's doing its best, but it's groaning under the weight of, uh, of this tidal wave of demand. Eventually, we do think that there'll be better balance between supply and demand. But you heard from the Bank of Canada, we heard from the Bank of Canada yesterday, they're a little bit more concerned. We do think that, you know, in the near term, the pressure is actually for even higher inflation. We think in the U.S., headline inflation in the next couple months might touch 6%. In Canada, famously, we've gotten up to 4.4%. That's the highest in 18 years. We think the headline inflation rate in Canada in the next couple months could get as high as 5%. But then we do think the fever will break. And inflation will start to come down a little bit. But I, the, if there's a really important message here, 
I want I want to tell you that at the end of next year, even by the end of 2022, we still see inflation higher than it was before the pandemic began. That is just to me an extraordinary development. You know, during the depths of the pandemic, people were worried about deflation. They were worried about negative interest rates. They're worried about prices falling. That's gone out the window. You know, now we're we're concerned about the high side risk of inflation. I, I tend to believe inflation will moderate in the next year, but we at this point are expecting inflation to average about three and a quarter percent next year, which is roughly what it's going to at the end of the day average for all of this year too. That that may not sound that scary, you know, given the fact that we've got over four percent inflation as as we speak. But historically speaking, we haven't seen inflation average more than 3% for a full year since 1991, and that happened to be the year the GST kicked in. Now, you can see the U.S. has still got higher inflation than uh, than Canada at this point. There's a few factors behind that. Uh, I, I list them at the bottom. Currency, cars, and COVID. Currency, that's the strength of the Canadian dollar, helping hold down inflation a little bit. It'd be even higher if the Canadian dollar hadn't strengthened so much over the last year. Cars, that's just a technical factor. Used car prices have jumped but they don't get counted in Canada CPI. They, they never have. Uh, that's nothing nefarious going on. It's just not, uh, it's Stats Canada years ago decided not to include used cars. They are included in the U.S. inflation measure. So that partly explains the big difference between the U.S. and Canadian inflation rates. And finally, COVID. Uh, what I mean there is they had the earlier reopening, and so they've had even more pressure on things like hotel charges and airfares. So if we turn to the next chart, Let's just dig a little deeper. What's what's causing this inflation? So the chart, or the, I should say the, the column on the right-hand side, those are the things that have gone up most in price in the last 12 months. You know, some of them are absolutely intuitive. Gasoline prices, no surprise there that they're ahead of the pack, and you can see natural gas isn't that far behind. I mentioned airfares and hotel chairs. They were in the depths of despair last year. You know, really no surprise that they've come back a little bit. They're still actually relatively low. Um, the level of, of prices there, They're, they've still got a little recovery to go. But as we work down that column, you get into, I think, somewhat more concerning issues. Things that look like they might have a little bit more staying power. Things like new home prices, meat, furniture, appliances. All of those things really do face a fundamental imbalance between supply and demand and could be a little bit more sticky. But the other feature of this table I'd like to point out is a lot of things on the left-hand side that have actually dropped in price. You know, things like telephone services, sports equipment, auto insurance, no surprise there, and clothing have all actually dropped in the last year. So I guess the main point here is just recall, there are some things that are actually still showing relatively moderate price gains, and it's not broad-based, you know, right across the board inflation we're seeing at, at this point. It is still relatively sector-specific. But if we turn to the next chart, I am still a little bit concerned, especially over the next year, and I don't at all downplay the risks on the inflation front. Every month, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business does a survey of its members of small and medium-sized businesses, and they ask a, a number of questions. But some they ask, you know, what's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? And that's basically what's in the table on the right-hand side. Now, the latest numbers actually just came out this morning, and I didn't have a chance to update this uh, this chart, but it really didn't change the main, the broad strokes. It was a very similar reading in October as it was to September. And in many ways, the responses are absolutely textbook, right in line with everything we're hearing about supply chains. The, the three top issues, which are in red, are issues that small businesses identify as being a bigger deal now than before the pandemic. And it's exactly what you would expect. Input shortages, labor shortages and distribution constraints. Meanwhile, things that may have been seen as a concern before the pandemic are seen as less of a concern now. Things like working capital or, or insufficient demand, that's actually not seen as a big issue uh, by most small businesses at this point or less of an issue than it was before the pandemic. And in many respects, as I said, this is textbook. So what do small businesses think is gonna happen to prices in this world? Well, I direct your attention to the chart on the left. And small businesses apparently are very good forecasters of inflation. They see the average price that they're going to have to charge in the next year rising by almost 4% over the next year. And that's very closely aligned to what we believe inflation will average over the next year. And you can see that the uh, the green line is what actual inflation has done versus expectations of small businesses. And you can see small businesses, like I said, are very good inflation forecasters. And they see upward pressure on prices persisting in the next year. They are not buying into this so-called transitory uh, narrative that a lot of central banks have, have tried to spoon feed us uh, for the last six months or so. By the way, one joke I've been saying for the last couple of years, is, or the last couple of weeks, I should say, is yes, dinosaurs were transitory too, and uh, yet they were around a long time and they could potentially do a lot of damage. Now, if we turn to the next chart, 
A couple other uh, elements of, of the inflation outlook I'd, I'd like to point to and will largely determine how long lasting it is. First on wages. And of course, you know, many of you are probably dealing with uh, with a, you know, with an issue of trying to find workers and, and you know, trying to pay them as well. I actually, I'm, I'm here to tell you, this is a much bigger deal now in the US than it is in Canada. It's, it's certainly, it's an issue in Canada, but it is an off the charts issue in the, in the US. Uh, right now, we have a lot of vacant jobs in, uh, in in Canada, but there are less vacant jobs than there are the number of people unemployed. So it's not an extreme mismatch in Canada just yet. In certain sectors, in certain regions, certainly, it is an extreme issue. But broadly, it's not quite at extremes yet. In the U.S., it is at extremes. There are over 10 million open jobs in the U.S. right now, and about 7 million people are counted as unemployed. That is just an incredible mismatch. You know, I, I've never seen anything like that before. And that just screams at wage pressure. You know, we've been hearing for weeks anecdotal evidence that wages are going up, but it's mostly in the low wage jobs. Areas like Amazon, uh, McDonald's, Walmart, they've all, you know, brought out these high profile uh, moves to increase wages. It hasn't really floated up the income scale yet, though. So we haven't seen a broad based rise in wages yet, but I think it's coming. And if we get that, if we get a really broad based run up in wages, that is where I think central banks will get really concerned and where we could have a bit more of a long lasting inflation impact in uh, our experience over the next couple of years. And that's certainly something I'll be watching very closely is what happens to wages in the next years. As, as, as I said, I think it's a bigger deal in the US than it is in Canada. Now, if we turn to the next chart, the other area that I'm keeping an eye on is home prices. And, you know, every country handles how home prices enter their consumer price basket a little bit differently. I wouldn't say anybody does it just right or just wrong. But the main message is that home prices take a while to really work their way into the official inflation numbers. And we're, I think there's a lot of sting in the tail, especially in the US again, on this front. It takes, it takes some time for the burst in home prices we've seen to really work its way into being reflected into you know what's reported in the uh, the monthly uh, CPI. It's it's starting to get there in Canada, but I think it's got a little way to run. It's it's definitely uh, coming in in the U.S. And now I do want to spend a couple of moments talking about the housing market. You know you may have heard stories recently about how home sales have really moderated from the madness that we had earlier this year. Well, the key word there is madness. It was madness back in February and March, and things have calmed a little bit. But make no mistake, the level of home sales, which the little arrow points to in the middle there, is still above anything we've seen in pre-pandemic years. Make no mistake, the market is incredibly strong still. It is extraordinarily tight at this point, and there is still upward pressure on home prices. And that leads me to the chart on the right, which I call my Canadian Football League chart. It's the change in home prices in the nine CFL cities in the last year. And you can see, first of all, every single CFL team has, uh, has seen their home prices in their market go up in the last year. But the other thing I would point out is the average Canadian home price is up by 21%. There's only one of the nine CFL cities that's above that. So what's going on here? You know, Hamilton's not a very big city. What's, uh, you know, what's driving it? Why, you know, why is the average price so high? Well, it's because all the mid-level cities, just to cut below the CFL, are rising even faster. You know, the Chilliwacks of the world, the Brandons, the London Ontarios, the Halifaxes, those are seeing extraordinarily strong gains. You know, we've got some of those cities rising 40%. And that's why the average price is so strong. And it's for all the reasons that you've heard. You know, if people are retiring earlier and looking for more affordable options or, you know, able to work remotely, you know, and moving out of the big city, this has been their chance to do it. And so we've seen a real rush to some of the smaller and more affordable medium-sized cities in this. And that's where the real home price are price pressure has been. Now looking ahead, you know, we're we're still constructive on the housing market, on home prices. We still think that, you know, the the balance still tilts in favor of sellers nationally. And we think that it will take higher interest rates to really bring this market to heel, which brings me to my next chart, please. And of course, just in recent days, and if you happen to see the the newspapers today or online, you saw the big story was the Bank of Canada's a uh, very aggressive statement yesterday, their, their move to first uh, bring an end to quantitative easing and uh, to basically warn that uh, interest rates look like they're going to rise sooner than what they had earlier expected. I have to tell you, full, full disclosure, I was surprised at how tough the message was from the Bank of Canada. In the lead up, financial markets had priced in, so-called priced in, a full percentage point of interest rate hikes for 2022. We thought the Bank of Canada would come out and maybe try to moderate that message. 
they didn't moderate it one iota. If anything, they threw a few logs on the fire and, you know, doubled down on the message. And so now the financial markets are actually priced even more aggressively. They think the first rate hike is coming in January. I think that's too early. I think the earliest realistically the Bank of Canada would raise interest rates would be April, but that's still miles earlier than what they were talking about just as recently as a few short months ago. Um, officially, we've got the first rate hike in July, and then we think that they hike rates by a quarter percent every calendar quarter right until they get rates back up to where they were before the pandemic began. So it would uh, take us till, uh, till late 2023. The risks are, again, clearly one-sided. Um, we think that there's a good chance that they could go earlier than that. They could go more often than that. They could even end up going a little bit higher than they did before. The one thing limiting them, then, them is the Fed hasn't even begun to hint that rates are going higher. The Fed hasn't even started to wind down their quantitative easing program. Bank Canada's finished quantitative easing. The Fed hasn't even begun to, begun to slow it yet. So the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, is miles behind the Bank of Canada. Eventually, we do think the Fed will slowly but surely change their language. Uh, we think they'll become increasingly more aggressive in the next six months. At this point, we see their first rate hike being coming in September, and then they too, we believe, will go by a quarter point every quarter. I have a hard time seeing the Fed going much earlier than that or going much more aggressively than that. So that will act as a little bit of a break on the Bank of Canada. Not an entire break. The bank, the bank has moved on its own before. If you look at that chart on the left, if you go way back to the last cycle, in 2010, the Bank of Canada at one point raised rates three times all by itself. It just hung out there all by itself. Now, in hindsight, they may have gone a little bit too early and too often, and they end up rewinding, unwinding some of that. But it just shows that there are occasions where the bank can act very independently, especially if they think the Canadian economy is diverging from, uh, from the U.S. Now, if we turn to the next chart, please. And I just have a couple more that uh, I'll end on here. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time talking about monetary policy. Let's spend a moment talking about fiscal policy in the short time I have left. Um, you know, so of course, famously, we, we had basically a status quo election and a result just a little bit more than a month ago. But while it was a political status quo, I, I like to say after the election, it's not necessarily going to be economic status quo. Because certainly every party out there made all kinds of lavish promises uh, during the election campaign, including the, the, the ruling liberals. And I take them at their word. Uh, they have, you know, shown quite... You know, quite a willingness to, uh, if, if they're uh, an, an upside surprise on revenues, they've they've shown a willingness to to spend that. And, uh, you know, you can see the, the budget deficit projections from the Parliamentary Budget Officer in the green. Uh, the Liberal platform would add on to that a little bit. You know, and of course, it's still a minority government. They need a dance partner. Uh, the NDP have even more lavish pr spending promises than the Liberals. Um, so, you know, if anything, the deficit might even be a little bit larger than what was in the Liberal platform. I do believe that ultimately the goal is to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio on the right hand side after it took that big, big step up during the pandemic. If there's any good news here, it's that the uh, the debt to GDP ratio is still well below the bad old days of the mid 1990s, at least at the federal level. And we're in a completely different interest rate environment than in the, the mid 1990s. So this is a lot more manageable. But the other thing I would point out is whenever you look at Canadian government finances, you do have to take the provinces into account. And many provinces are actually at record levels of debt. So when we add the provinces to the federal government, I don't think there's any time for complacency on this front, even though we do, you know, we, we do have relatively um, a favorable interest rate environment. I think that they're, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're still, ideally, we still would like to see that deficit come down as the economy recovers and come down in a pretty meaningful fashion. And if we just turn to my last chart on the, on the Canadian dollar, um, even, uh, you know, even though I, I do have some concern about the, uh, the, the deficit situation, of course, every major economy, and especially the U.S., is still dealing with, you know, many of the same issues that we're dealing with on the fiscal side. So I don't really see that as a block to the Canadian dollar. The dollar has had a tremendous recovery from the depths of the pandemic. Recall, at one point, it got below 70 cents, and now as we speak, it's above 80 cents. Our core view is over the next 12 to 18 months, the Canadian dollar is more likely to strengthen a little bit further rather than weaken. You know, in a world of close to $80 oil, anywhere in that neighborhood, in a world of relatively firm commodity prices, a, a firming global economy, we're still constructive on the Canadian dollar overall. It's not a one-way trip north from here by any means, um, but we are relatively constructive on the currency over the near term. Longer term, it's a different story. If you know me well or if you've heard me speak before, you know I'm no great bull on the Canadian dollar longer term. 
I believe we have a lot of very serious competitive challenges over the medium term, and I view a fair value for the currency over the medium term as being more in the 75 to 80 cent range. Um, I see I've exactly hit the, the target in terms of timing, uh, so I'd now like, uh, if we can just turn to the Q&A slide, I'd like to invite Paul back in, and uh, hopefully I can handle some of your questions that have come in or some that have come in while I've spoken. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Doug. Um, we last gathered customers together to speak with you in late May, and since then, obviously, a lot has happened, uh, some challenging uh, and some encouraging as well. Um, a number of the comments that you've raised have, have sparked a, um, a, a number of questions, so I'll get right to it. Reflecting first on the regional outlook, uh, and this first question comes out of a Grand, pra Grand Prairie, Alberta. Uh, Alberta's GDP, which you spoke about, has indeed been on quite a journey, and you mentioned there's uh, lots of upside, uh, a clear upside, I think was a direct quote. Can you speak to the resiliency of the pr provincial economy and workforce, the infrastructure, and specifically the ability to diversify? Do you see an ability to emulate some of the other Canadian economies uh, in the future? Short answer is is I do. Um, I, I and and you know of course one one thing Alberta has going for it probably more so than any other economy. It's got a few things going for it, of course. But one thing, of course, is it's it's not its first rodeo with uh, you know with wild swings in its economy. You know, of course, we Alberta's been through the ringer. I've 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 been at this job, uh, full disclosure, for for many decades, and I've seen a number of you know vicious cycles in in Alberta. The, Alberta probably more than any other economy in the country uh, sees real booms and it sees real busts as well. So, you know, it's 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 it probably better than any province knows knows how to deal with this and has has uh, has been there, done that before. And you know, I, I I will tell you also when we talk about real GDP, that is not a be all and end all measure by by any respects. Um, you know, it it doesn't capture as well things like incomes and government revenues and and that sort of thing that can really be whipped around uh, by the price side of thing. You know, if we look at nominal income, you know, forget volumes. If we look at nominal incomes and you know nominal revenues, nominal earnings, that sort of thing, they've really got a lot of upside. In Alberta, due to the nice comeback in uh, in, in energy prices in in general, and of course there is more to Alberta than uh, than energy. The uh, the agriculture sector is actually relatively well placed at this point. My colleague Aaron Gertson put out a, a good report on the ag outlook about a month ago or so. Um, it, its title was "Will Food Feed Higher Inflation?" But it uh, it looked at the agriculture sector in general. And if you haven't had a chance, I'd uh, direct you to it. But you know, one one of the main points there is uh, even though they face a lot of cost pressures, um, at at this point, generally speaking, the uh, the agricultural backdrop is is very strong, especially for the uh, the livestock uh, sector in in particular. The tourist sector, another big one for uh, for Alberta and of course for uh, for BC as well. That of course has absolutely been wall up, probably more so than any other sector. By COVID, I, I I do think that's a sector that will come back in a significant way in the medium term, and I still think it's got great medium term growth uh, potential. Um, broadening out to other sectors, I've always been impressed, uh, and this definitely goes for BC as well, at the uh, the emergence of the tech sector in uh, in Alberta. I was actually, I actually spoke just <laughs> fortunately enough just before the pandemic at a at a big conference in in Alberta that uh, was uh, was just dealing with uh, the, its its emerging tech sector, and I was very impressed. Uh, with how uh, you know how broad-based and how healthy it, it was and it certainly uh, gave me a lot of optimism now of course you know alberta more than any other province is going to be left with the, the hangover of uh, vacant office space in in particular uh, that's going to require workout no uh, no two ways about it but uh, i'm I, I am relatively optimistic on on the economy's medium term outlook the, the last thing i would leave you with and this definitely is a story for bc and to to an extent in saskatchewan is as as well less less so in manitoba but for all the three Western provinces, I would assert that structurally, they, they're in the best fiscal position of the 10 provinces. They, all for different reasons, they all got here in a different way, but the three westernmost provinces have the best fiscal finances, provincial finances in, in the country. They have the lowest debt ratios and, uh, and have relatively low taxation, generally speaking as well, believe it or not. I know for some of you that may be a hard, uh, hard to believe, but it's a lot lower than in Ontario and Quebec. And I, I, I think that gives all three of those provinces really a firm leg up over the, the medium term, the relatively robust uh, fiscal position. Doug, let's explore exactly that topic uh, as it relates to fiscal position and your earlier slide around the deficit path. Um, the questions came in quickly. I'm going to attribute this one uh, to some of our clients in BC, specifically uh, coming out of Nelson, BC, 
Uh, there's a question around uh, the recent federal government announcements regarding COVID related support programs. Um, do you see these changes as having a material impact on our economy one way or another as we move forward? And uh, maybe the million dollar, billion dollar question, how are we going to pay for this stimulus moving forward? So I'll start with the uh, the first one and both those are, are great questions. Um, and, and I probably should have, uh, I should have touched on, on that very important development. I, I, I think it was an important step by this government to basically wind down the queues and the, and the CERB or the CERB light that we were dealing with in, in recent months. I think, first of all, that was a, a bit of a statement of confidence in the economy. It was uh, an admission of reality that provinces like BC and Ontario were getting closer to basically being fully reopened, for instance, in, uh, in the local, my local province here in Ontario, uh, restaurants were able to go up to full capacity for the first time. And I don't think it's a complete coincidence that ha that happened at almost the same time that the queues in the CERB were, were effectively put uh, put to bed. I think I actually, I give a lot of credit to Ottawa for, for change, um, for, for, you know, basically getting this about right. Like they, they basically have said they will support those sectors that are directly affected and they will support folks if we face uh, renewed lockdowns. I think that's the right way to handle that at this point. We, we really do have to take off the training wheels in terms of subsidies. I think there's a pretty good case to be made that they had overstayed their welcome. Um, it was arguably one of the reasons why there is, uh, you know, a lot of firms are having trouble finding workers or had been having trouble finding workers. I think there's a lot of reasons why people have been a bit reluctant to, to come back to work, but I, I think you can make a case that the, the generosity of some of the government programs may have played a little bit of a role, um, frankly. And so I, and, and I think to their credit, I think the, the, the government did recognize that. And that's, that's why they, they moved away. And, you know, the, the new programs are expected to cost 7 billion, which is not nothing um, by, by May, but that's a fraction of the roughly, you know, two or $300 billion they've spent on these programs in the past 18 months. You know that get that gives you a sense the you know to to the extent that they really are rolling off in in a big big way. Will it have an effect on the economy? Yes, for sure it will. Um, there there are there are going to be some businesses that are are going to be caught out here. Um, there there it just isn't going to be enough support for them. There are going to be some people you know for different reasons who are going to have a hard time getting back uh, in in the labor force who are who are going to be caught short here. I don't I don't downplay that there there will be some people left left aside by this um unfortunately hopefully it'll be relatively very small numbers but i do think it's a step we had to take uh to get to try to get to the next stage and to to get us back to something like a a more normal uh economy at, at this point you know even, even the you know the finance minister herself said it, you know we we had to get, basically get ourselves back on a more affordable uh, footing at, 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 at this point. Uh, the second part of the question, that's that, you know, let's face it, uh, if, if I had to say what is the one issue concern I've had the most in, since the pandemic, it's that one. How are we going to pay for this? Well, you know, it's it's in, in a way that chart on government debt, to answer your question, it, it basically mostly fell on Ottawa's balance sheet that we took a hopefully one time big step up in the amount of debt that they have on the books. That's going to have to be you know, serviced for for decades to come. I don't I don't downplay it all, at all, at all. But you know, the good news is Ottawa can still borrow money for thirty years at two percent, basically in line with their long term inflation target. That's that is that is manageable. You know, in in many ways, I I thank goodness that this happened at a time when inter, interest rates were incredibly low and you know real interest rates were actually negative, and it didn't happen at a time back in the mid nineteen nineties when our government finances were pushed to the wall. You know, in, in many ways, we were we were lucky on on from that perspective because the government was in a position where they could take on a lot of debt and it didn't ruin, you know, the the credit worthiness of, of the government. The other the other point I would make, you know, I I, I used to always, for decades, I, I used to joke that Canada was the best looking horse in the glue factory when it came to a fiscal position uh, compared to other other economies. It's still true, you know. Every, everybody's gone through the fiscal ringer in the in the last eighteen months. And every, every, you know, when, when we come out on the other side of this, our, our finances are still going to look a little bit better than others. That's, that's not to say I'm complacent. We've, we've got to roll some of these, these stimulus measures off. We've got to get government finances back in better shape. I, I know I'm going on and on here. The last thing I would say on that front is there's actually been quietly a lot of good news at the provincial level right across the country. 
you know, a lot of provinces have actually printed much smaller budget deficits than what they initially expected during the depths of the pandemic. My own province was probably the poster child for that. You know, they were expecting a deficit. I believe it was something like $38 billion. It came in at $16 billion. You know, like I've, I, I've never seen, you know, that, that kind of a miss before. It was just unbelievable. Um, and, and, you know, that, that was the most extreme case, but, a, but a lot of provinces have actually, you know, just the, the fiscal hit just wasn't nearly as, as bad. New Brunswick actually managed to run a budget surplus last year. Uh, so at the provincial level, you know, the damage really wasn't as deep. Ottawa really did shoulder most of the burden. I think that was appropriate. Doug, I'm, I'm still getting over the imagery of the horse. Apologies in advance uh, to our <laughs> horse lovers amongst our clients, but it's quite powerful. And there's a number of things that you just mentioned that are clearly on the minds of our customers. You mentioned earlier subsidies. And so a question coming out of my old hometown of Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, is uh, earlier this year, we saw American and for that matter, global protectionism uh, at play. How do you feel now versus six months ago is the world more complicated or is there a spirit of cooperation that's starting to emerge on the economic fronts? So it's interesting. One, uh, one area where there actually was some synchronicity between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is especially in their dealings with China, uh, but more, mod, uh, more broadly on the trade front. Um, I would say trade policy is a little bit more predictable and stable, not surprisingly, under uh, Biden administration, but... I wouldn't characterize it as being less protectionist. You know, historically, of course, Democrats have been even more protectionist than the Republican counterparts. Trump was an anomaly, to say the least, uh, in more ways than one. Um, but especially on the trade front, I mean, he was he was actually much probably more protectionist than than Democrats. But um, but you know, we, we we don't have the drama under under Trump. We don't have you know the threats of you know, 35% tariffs on you, Mexico, or on you, China. We don't we don't have that under under the Biden administration, but that doesn't mean the the threat has gone away. You know, fortunately enough, uh, just before the pandemic, we did sign off on USMCA or Cosma, uh, whichever way you want to look at it. So we've got a, a little bit of certainty here in Canada, but you know, we've 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 got a lot of issues. Let's let's face it. The first thing the Biden administration did cancel Keystone. Um, you know, th you know, then he's really pushing hard on uh, on Buy America. He hasn't given us any support on the Enbridge uh, pipeline that uh, basically supplies gasoline to Quebec and Ontario. Um, he's really doing Canada no favors, and I'm I'm very concerned on things like Buy America that he's really not going to give us much of a break. But more broadly, I think it. You know, I I'm I'm expecting this administration to still be pretty protectionist, predictably protect, protectionist, without the drama of the prior administration, but still pretty protectionist. Meanwhile, you know, a subplot to that is just this back and forth friction with with China, which started under Trump, but it really hasn't gone away. And I think that's going to, you know, after we emerge from the pandemic, I I think that's going to be the, the issue I'm really watching. Uh, geopolitically, I definitely think it's the biggest the biggest flashpoint the biggest concern and probably the biggest issue in the next 10 years are US China relations. Um, I don't I don't at all uh, downplay the you outlook know, for Taiwan and what might happen there. I think that's an obvious trigger of real friction between the two, but there's there's lots of disagreements uh, between the two. Obviously we have to work with China. We have to deal with them. Um, you know it's not like the the good old days of the Cold War where there really were no interrelationships between Russia and uh, at least financially or economically between Russia or the Eastern, Eastern Europe and, and the West. But, you know, we're, we're both, we're in this dance. Uh, they rely on us and we rely on them um, between uh, the West and, and, and China. So we have to deal with them. But I, I do believe that is, is going to be the number one issue. And I, I would just remind, by the way, before the pandemic, you know, what, what was the biggest concern in, in financial markets? Well, U.S.-China trade relations. Interesting. Um, I think uh, as we speak to the, the, this concept of interconnectivity and perhaps a little closer to home, um, a chief economist once talked about the madness of home sales and the constructive outlook uh, for housing prices and for that matter, interest rates. I was in Edmonton yesterday. I saw a, a sign outside of a, a store that said uh, mortgage rates are on the rise. Uh, lock in now. And so I see a question coming out of the Okanagan uh, during our time together. What does this mean to valuations? And uh, uh, on the off side of that, uh, 
how will labor shortages in construction um, in markets impact uh, prices moving forward? So I will start with the second question because it's a little bit easier. Um, you know, even even before the pandemic, skilled shortages, especially in the in the trades and in construction, it was an issue for the industry. It it will act as a limiter. It will act as as a limit in terms of how much building activity can actually get done. And and I heard this concept, you know, years ago uh, from those in in the industry that you know there were, there were actually only so many houses we could build a year. Um, but I will tell you the the industry, despite all the howls and cries from you know some of my other economist friends and 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 those in the industry about how we need more supply and we need more supply, I will tell you the industry is really doing a good job. In the last 12 months, we've had 270,000 houses started. Now a lot of those are multis, but uh, you know those are the kind of numbers I've not seen in my career. Uh, you have to go all the way back to the mid 70s when uh, you know the leading edge of the baby boom was really starting to, to buy homes and entering. You know we had household formation growth that was just off the charts. That was the last time we saw uh, housing starts anywhere close to current levels before the pandemic. A good year for a Canadian housing starts was about 220 220 thousand. And the last 12 months, as I said, it's been about 270,000. So builders are really doing, I think, a fantastic job of trying to meet that demand. It, it takes time, you know, especially in the multi-unit space to finish those for those to come on stream. But they will come on stream. The supply is coming, but it's 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 being challenged, keeping up with demand. And that goes to the the first part of your question. You know, what's what's the outlook for uh, for the housing market? You know, is is there you know is there a chance that we could have a, a steep steep correction? Well. You know, I, I, I think before we talk about any correction of prices, we have to, you know, go back to that one chart I showed that the average home price in Canada is up more than 20% in the past year. That's just in the last 12 months. You know, they, 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 they'd risen a lot in, in the years before that as well. You know, it would have to be a really deep correction to, uh, you know, to even get us uh, back to the levels that we were at in, in 2016, 2017. I, I, I personally think it takes a lot to lead to an outright severe drop in, in home prices. The one time that I've seen a real pullback in prices in in my days, uh, well, there were two. There were one in the early 80s and one in the early 90s. And both of them were triggered by double-digit interest rates. We're not going back to double-digit interest rates, I don't believe. Um, but it would take it would take a pretty significant rise in interest rates to really undercut this market. I do believe rates will go up enough to blunt the gains. I think we're going to have a pretty notable deceleration in price gains over the next year. I'm I'm still skeptical at this point that we'll actually see a, a note rate reversal. In other words, a drop in prices. I, I'd, I'd like to see the market cool down first before I, you know, slow its price gains before I actually call for out rate declines. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, it really does depend on how quickly and how aggressively the bank raises interest rates. My view is they won't raise them aggressively enough to, to lead to an out rate reversal in the market. Doug, in, in looking at uh, the uh, different parts of our economy, I did want to spend a moment on, on the election uh, that you referenced earlier on. Um, this is a question out of Fort McMurray, uh, hearing, hearing some early sound bites from our new federal ca cabinet. And so I'm wondering as it relates to the balancing act of the environment and the oil patch, um, what does this mean for Canadian oil exports, uh, exports rather, uh, in the foreseeable future? So my underlying view has has been that Canadian oil production is is probably about about as high as it's, it's going to get. Um, does that mean it's going to go into a fast decline? No, I, I, I don't believe that. Um, one of our energy analysts put out a piece of a few months ago that actually showed that the oil sands might actually be one of the last production sources standing because so many of the costs in the sector are fixed costs that have already been built in and now it's basically a manufacturing. It doesn't need a whole lot of new investment. It's basically just requires maintenance investment. So, you know, no matter what, you know, Wall Street or Bay Street thinks of, of the sector, it doesn't necessarily need a whole lot of new funds or investment to, to keep it going. It can, you know, as long as prices are relatively healthy, which they are certainly healthy now, uh, the industry can continue to, to uh, you know, to, to create production. Uh, I just don't see a lot of growth. I think most of the investment now is in the sector is is going to be main, maintaining what we have, and I think it'll probably be more of a, a slow decline over over the decades ahead, in terms of uh, Canadian production. So it'll it'll go you know from being a, a high growth industry of the last couple decades to to a very mature industry, and it happened in a, in a relatively short period of time. 
Uh, I would just stress that as long as prices are still relatively strong, um, you know, anything close to current levels or say $70 a barrel, uh, that, that, that's still a healthy level. It can still mean strong incomes and strong, strong government revenues for the, for the province. And, and hopefully it will give Alberta time to, uh, you know, to, to morph to and, and to, to focus on, on other industries in the decades ahead. I don't want to get too much into the politics, but I, I will say, it, you know, it did seem to me that, uh, you know, the choices in the, that uh, the Prime Minister took in terms of, you know, who is in natural resources and the environment, it seemed like a pretty strong statement that uh, if anything, the, the government's going to get, uh, the federal government's going to get even more serious in terms of uh, the, the climate file. It, it did seem like it, it took a pretty hard shaft in, in terms of who they appointed to, uh, to various positions. Mm-hmm. Doug, I'm wondering if you can give us just a quick soundbite. Uh, this question is coming out of uh, Saskatchewan um, and specifically focused on Saskatoon and Regina, but I think is a proxy uh, for many of the urban cores. You spoke about this earlier. You've got a recent publication, the hollowing out of the downtowns that's happening in the office space. Is that a sign of the future, pandemic related exclusively? What do you, what's your prediction uh, for corporate real estate uh, for the foreseeable future? So from, uh, and then by the way, I specialize in sound bites, um, from, from a very big picture view, um, I, I would say the, uh, the commercial real estate sector has held up a lot better than anybody would have, would have believed. And that, that goes right across the board. I mean, you know, immediately everyone identified the retail space and the office space as being under the, the most extreme pressure. But because of government support, because of very low interest rates, because of strong pricing um, or better than expected pricing, the sector actually has managed to, to work through an incredibly challenging environment. Those two sectors obviously still face a, a long, a long comeback. But uh, a colleague of mine, Rob Kavsik, put out a piece earlier this year, you know, will, uh, will the, the city centers shine again? And his, his end conclusion was, was ultimately yes, that this will be a, ultimately a passing phase, a very difficult passing phase. But ultimately, these the, the downtowns will recover. Um, you know, and, and if, if we, I'm, I'm not a historian, but if we if we look at it over thousands or hundreds of years rather than you know hundreds of months, let's let's face it, humans have tended to urbanize, have tended to congregate. They want to congregate. They want to urbanize, and I, I do think that that's a relentless trend, and uh, that goes for Saskatchewan too. Uh, I think ultimately uh, Regina and Saskatoon will uh, will thrive over over the uh, next three to five years. Doug, uh, with that uh, and that, that note, uh, perhaps we'll, we'll come to a close. We've reached time on our agenda. Uh, I'd like to start in bringing this to a close by uh, thanking all of our customers uh, for joining in on the conversation. Uh, based on the number of questions uh, that we've seen come in over the course of the last hour, clearly we've touched on some topics that are top of mind and we can continue to build that out uh, as we move forward. We're looking to hold more sessions to keep uh, our customers updated and informed. I'd encourage you to let your business banker know how we can help you. Your thoughts on if you found this valuable or what you would like to see more of is welcomed feedback. Certainly here at the bank, we believe having dialogues like this is important to all of us as we continue to navigate an extraordinary environment and ongoing dialogue with our business customers is key to helping us respond effectively uh, as a bank. And a word of acknowledgement that here at BMO, we absolutely believe that running a business is an act of courage and that's never been more true than right now. And we feel truly privileged to be your bank. We're working to ensure that we are in the right to continue to work with you moving forward. So again, thanks to each of our customers. Thank you, Doug, for, for such great insight uh, and to each uh, of our customers as well for the client, the questions that have come in and to take full advantage of the question and answer time we've had with you. With that, I'll perhaps bid adieu by saying, stay healthy, stay safe, and please everyone keep in touch. All the best. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone.